we would like to call on the stage our next guest speaker who has flown thousands of miles from Nepal, uh, architect Saroj Pradhan. Saroj Pradhan is Nepal-based architect, artist who believes in holistic living. He has won several design competitions and was awarded J.K. Foundation Young Architect of the Year Award in Bangalore in 2004. He heads the design firm Saroj Pradhan and uh, Associates based in Kathmandu, Nepal and is editor-in-chief of Spaces, Nepalese Architectural Art and Design Journal. Uh, with an early, uh, early interest in art design, his firm has won and implemented several national design competitions such as Deva Sedu Commun Community Center and the Sculptural uh, Memorial inside the U.S. Embassy in Nepal. He has an added inner dimension for poetry, yoga, music, and meditation, and also shares his experiences in the open secret world. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our speaker, Zarosh Pratham. Thank you. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Khush <laughs> amdeed. Namaste. Uh, I think it's really wonderful that uh, you, know, you have this interesting topic uh, that brings us all together. And I'd like to share that when I heard this topic, I was in Ladakh, in India. We are doing a small project there, a wellness center. And I was always, uh, I mean, then I was thinking that I wish I could cross the border. I saw so much of the Indian, you know, uh, there is the Indian army placed all over. But I think as human beings, you know, when there is the word Nepal or Pakistan or India removed and we look at the Himalayas, we're all connected with the mountains and the spirit of the place. Okay. Uh, yes, so the context of uh, this, uh, uh, I think this conference is very, uh, you know, I had the intention that I wanted to come to Pakistan and uh, this paper landed in my email and I wrote uh, two paragraphs within half an hour and sent it and the next I get this uh, you know, beautiful short mail from Tanya saying your paper is selected. And uh, therefore I'd like to share uh, some of my experiences and uh, which are of a larger context relating the earthquake as well as a few of my projects that I feel that uh, kind of translate the transformation and lessons of communal spaces. So I think the first thing when um, we experience the earthquake uh, as human beings, we definitely th did not think as architects. We left our buildings and we searched for these open spaces. Uh, the two images that are my uh, starting slide, uh, one is of a place that I'm working in the Annapurna area, it's called the uh, Manang Valley, which is very beautiful. And the other one below you see, it's the Kashtavandab site, which is, uh, the name Kat, uh, Kathmandu is derived from this, uh, this temple, which is right in the center of the city. So this whole building collapsed. And uh, first I think let me introduce, uh, how many of you have uh, been to Nepal? Oh, there's quite a few, uh, but quite a few haven't. So I'll just take a few slides to show uh, the uniqueness of my country. Uh, it's a rainbow of diverse people with the mountains, the hills, and the Rai region. There, uh, there is a big cross-section of uh, cultures that integrate. And uh, with the blend of uh, art, architecture, cuisine, music, literature, there's also different philosophies that intermingle. And I feel that culture is a product of our ancestors. And we have these stupas and temples, which we are very proud of, which we feel that identify our, uh, you know, identity. So I think the product of our priorities and actions, you know, which our heritage had, is different from what it is today. But it is definitely stems from the people, and the place as it evolves, and the environment. So with uh, the passage of time, various crafts uh, evolved. The way we make bricks, 
the way we do our designs that relate to our culture and the stories that we hear in our mythology, and also the pottery and simple crafts of wood, metal, um, you know, clay that evolved. This is a slide of uh, Kathmandu Valley in 1950, taken by uh, Tony Hagen, who was the first official visitor with visa number one in, uh, to Kathmandu. And when you look at 1950, it's not too long, it's just, uh, you know, 68 years back. And what it is uh, today, it's, you know, we've lost all the farming and all the open spaces. Uh, yet, uh, when you kind of contextualize all the cities in the world, I think this is not an isolated problem of only Nepal or Kathmandu. It's happening everywhere. Uh, this is the Nath Stupa in 1950, which had these fields all around, and there was, you know, what we in architecture call a scale, where we could experience it. Today, in 2000, uh, when the earthquake happened, and soon after in 2016, this is the kind of density that uh, is around it. This is a view of uh, Bhaktapur, a very uh, popular destination and very well preserved uh, a little place. Uh, that uh, there, there, there is many uh, festivals there. This is the sea of people in one of the jatras, we call it. And the image below is when the earthquake happened. And uh, you see it isolated, people were all confused. And I think this is part of organic architecture where, you know, it is not built to last forever. But over time, nature reminds us that maybe we need to take care of it. You know, some of the wood that lay, this is the Kastamandap Square where the name Kathmandu is derived. It was completely flattened. There was a blood donation camp that was going on. And I think around uh, 25 people perished in this, uh, this place. So it was a very deep reflection time. I think uh, it brought the community together in terms of, I was out in uh, one of the Nuakot villages helping out with all whatever resources I had. But it was sure uh, a moment where we did not feel that, you know, I think we are doing this profession or that profession. It was a time when all the community, no matter who you were, you said that you're a Nepali, let's go and help other Nepalese. So we, we saw a lot of places in our inner Baha's courtyards where, you know, these monuments completely collapsed. And that spirit of, uh, you know, losing everything, I think it also, in a way, it makes you very strong. You feel that uh, maybe slowly and steadily we, we should rebuild. So those moments were, this is an image of the army camp where uh, I stayed for a couple of days with my family. And it was a very deep reflection time of rethinking about the days ahead, how would reconstruction go, as well as uh, relating to everyone in a very simple manner. And Nepal, uh, besides the mountains and the beautiful temples, it's also a, a, a country of chaos in terms of political governance, in terms of the density, in terms of the revolution, in terms of monarchy changing into a parliamentary system. And we have problems that exist everywhere, density, garbage, but yet, when we look at uh, you know certain places like Bhaktapur and Patan and you know the heritage that we gifted it, there are dreams that uh, come into you know creative people that think that you know once the governance comes together, we will be able to showcase what we have been gifted with. And I think uh, the question of uh, identity comes in where uh, we're looking at, uh, you know, this rich heritage passed on to us as a burden or precious inheritance, a gift or trusted responsibility. And this is the dilemma of uh, all of us there as uh, architects. We see our city in the crossfire of uh, globalization, where international chains and hotels are coming in, but yet we see these little, you know, almost like ornaments you know, almost like jewelry shining in, in places for it to kind of work together. A little background of the earthquake. Uh, we had a major earthquake in 1934, and uh, it is a kind of uh, 
documented that in Nepal the mountains are moving because of the two plateaus crossing each other. And every 75 years is predicted for a major earthquake. So this one that came in uh, 2015, it was after uh, 81 years, it's quite close. So in a way we have this uh, fear that we need to cater to, but yet economically people are not rich to build like Japan. So how do we, it's, but it's a, it's a time when it comes cyclically to think that the way we build, is it correct? Should things evolve? Should things change? New materials have come into the market. While UNESCO says that you have to rebuild with whatever authentic material that uh, kind of exists, uh, there is also this big debate about how do we introduce new superior materials into these old structures. Uh, in day one in Kathmandu, like uh, uh, a background of the valleys, the, the three subsidies Kathmandu Valley, Paktapur, and Patan. So Kathmandu is a kind of more a focus of the government, so you have the center taking care of it. But the center sent bulldozers into these heritage sites. And uh, as a first reaction, we thought it was good. But on hindsight, we feel that it really destroyed you know, all the wooden pieces, all the artifacts. And uh, we felt that if that would have gone a little slow, perhaps we could have salvaged uh, a lot of it. The other city, uh, Patan, which has a more community dominance, it's more integrated with, uh, with the place, saw something very different happen. There were no bulldozers. There were the community which came in and kind of uh, looked at, you know, the heritage that had fallen apart. And there was a reflection as to how to keep it. You know, simple things like, because it was the monsoon season was coming, how to just put a, a piece of plastic so that the wood, the wood would not rot. So these simple efforts by the community with the governance kind of helped uh, you know, understand what were damaged, how to take care of it. And uh, the courtyards, the communal spaces, I think were very instrumental in kind of uh, keeping all these pieces together. And uh, we see a lot of uh, artifacts being stolen and taken into Western countries. But these courtyards acted as spaces to really protect. So soon uh, the, the, the women and you know, the local community were involved in the various processes of the reconstruction. And I think each, uh, each part, uh, piece, wherever they could, was put in a small shed, accounted for, and one by one, the effort to kind of relook into our old books and understand and try to get more information as to how to rebuild. Uh, this is a slide of one of the pillars in Patan that kind of broke. And uh, there was this heated deb debate about how to put you know, this broken stone together. And I think you know, with the advancement of medicine and you know, the way we kind of use it uh, is also applicable to architecture. So the local community said, why not you know, have a piece of metal inside it and support it because it's a heavy piece. So while UNESCO says that no, you cannot do all this, but I think the community voice, if it's collective, it is, it is stronger. So these, uh, these are the present status of uh, some of the temples and you know, some of the work that is going in a very slow process, but it is heartening to see that uh, at least there is that uh, kind of sensitivity towards this craft and uh, heritage that exists. So the lesson, le uh, lessons learned and challenges were really how to rebuild in a structurally sound way and not just an aesthetic way or just looking at history. And trying to get the exact standards required and how to involve the community I think was very crucial. And it's not uh, easy to involve the community but I think in times of trouble, I feel that the community spirit comes out much stronger. You know, when, when your economy is good, everyone is in their own little castle. But when there is a problem, it's, it's so heartening to see people overlap with other professions. So the government of Nepal, the Department of Archaeology, 
and uh, local community efforts were uh, critical in, in, in certain core areas. I must say that it's not the case in all the places, but in some of the places where we've seen good example, it's really happening and sets a very high standard of what can be achieved. So I think there was also a challenge of uh, old and new materials when we see damaged pieces how to integrate you know new piece of wood or design into the old we also uh, experience the ins insufficient skilled craftsmen you know which is dwindling all the time but it was also a moment where you know all the money that we received from the community from the donors were also used in kind of understanding the skills that we could encourage so the other challenge was also to get wood timber because it's expensive now and kind of see alternative ways how to do it in a more efficient manner. So that was a little bit of the earthquake. There is enough material on the web or you must have seen it but just to give you a feel. And I'll just uh, show you a few of the projects that I've been involved with. One is called Warikas and this is also an interesting project because uh, it was started by a person called Warika Das. And he used to take long walks inside the valley and see these houses that were coming, falling apart and you know all these carved pieces were kind of being trashed. So he went on to a process of bartering. He used to say, I'll give you a new window, give me your old window that you're throwing away. And slowly that evolved into a storage area where he had collected two, three hundred original windows. And uh, when I got involved on the, in this project, it was really a process to document uh, how we would take uh, all these artifacts into a new uh, building. So we first of all kind of uh, made an inventory of the entire collection and understood the size, the scale, the width, the kind of combinations, permutation it had, and identified all the different uh, you know, elements of the three-phase window, the tikis here, which is the one phase, and the pillars. And then we studied our three sub-cities to see the kind of language that existed. You know, like in Bhaktapur, we have the 55 windows, so there is a certain kind of repetition uh, of windows. So we said, why not uh, this space? Uh, this, was turning, this was being turned into a heritage hotel. So we said, why don't we repeat it like the 55 windows with the pillars on top? And then there is the big window, small window, the way we put these little niches. Those are really the simple ear, eyes, nose combination of our Nepali um, and Nepali architecture. So we had a small workshop where we kind of experimented with the craftsman and kind of understood what could be done. So these are the rooms that uh, we kind of uh, uh, came up with where all the elements that we had, whether it was a pillar or a small piece, could be reused within the room as far as possible. And I think this hotel, no matter you know, what problem we've gone through, the Maoist conflict or you know, the governance problem, everyone that comes to Nepal would want to stay in this hotel because it kind of resonates the spirit that exists there. Uh, this is the swimming pool, which has got this little naga and a mandala, and a repetition of uh, the stone spouts. So I feel that, uh, you know, from our heritage, there's a lot of music, there's a lot of scale, there's a lot of uh, understanding that we can emulate and kind of uh, put it into our space. So if you change the quality or the scale of your room, which the original traditional architecture was very small and you know it happens with most of the traditional architecture within the valley but you change the scale and give it room and air suddenly it can be called luxurious you know it's competing with the Amman resorts and uh, I feel that uh, the way you use material the way you use uh, uh, fabric the way you use uh, wood you know it's all a, is a statement of what exists in our community and then overall these two buildings really form a nice courtyard where the chaos in the street outside is kind of cut off. So moving up to the mountains, for those of you who have not been out of Karachi or not seen your mountains or not been to Nepal, this is our uh, gateway to the Everest area, it's called Lukla. And uh, it's a small S-trip that kind of slides upward 
And the scary part is, uh, you know, when you're flying out, you like going downwards, racing, and you better take off at the end. So as soon as uh, you're out of uh, the urban context of uh, cars and uh, mobiles and, you know, you're in fresh air, I think your body behaves very differently. And for me, I've done several projects up in the mountain, and the mountains, I feel, have really changed me. For, uh, I started practicing uh, yoga, and I think for anyone who treks or walks up in the mountain, it comes quite naturally. You know, you're not with too many people, you kind of uh, have a lot of time to reflect, you, have, you, you are very hungry, so you enjoy, you know, whatever food you get and relish it, you don't overdo it. So, I think my experiences up in the mountain changed me for the better, I would say, because initially as an architect I was doing a lot of projects in the valley, but doing projects up in the mountain really taught me how to go slow and enjoy things. So this was one little resort I'd done, all out of uh, stone and uh, pebbles. And I think it's a luxury these days to kind of build uh, these small uh, houses that uh, kind of have a strong sense of material and place and you know I think these are communal spaces that we can identify ourselves with. Uh, another project is uh, what you see as the Kwandi Resort was something that a client of mine wanted to do because there are, there's a heavy traffic up in the Everest area and we wanted, uh, he wanted to do a resort and so we took a ride to this place. This is the spectacular view. You see Mount Everest, the Lhotse, Lhotse, Amadaglam. It's a very majestic site and very inspirational. So when we reached this site and I saw the mountains and I saw what architecture existed, I kind of said, you know, a small sketch of drawing. I said, why not we kind of have a pyramid? Of course, you see pyramids in, in Egypt, but when you look at its form, the stability, and you see the context of the mountains, the Everest, you know, it's, it's a pyramid in a certain sense. So then uh, we made some renderings, and of course, these are visuals that uh, we discussed with our client, and then the difficult process of construction. So here I'd like to discuss one point uh, regarding the community. You know, we had two sections of people working here. One were the Sherpas from the local place. And we found that, you know, I think in any place when, you know, we have the workers, we tend to take it for granted and we tend to work, you know, with a laid back effort. And we experienced this in the project. Though the Sherpas are very good at climbing, but in the construction project, we felt that they were, you know, taking their time. So we got a group of uh, people from the Tarai area. They're more Indian inclined. But then we gave them blue jackets and red jackets. And we said, okay, you do this wall and you do that wall. Suddenly we felt the project kind of, you know, there was a competition spirit. And saying, oh, the Sherpas are, you, uh, you, the Madesis have done so much and the Sherpas have not done this. And suddenly the project started taking another pace. So I feel that good competition uh, is essential. Otherwise, you take it for granted. You know, you, you just kind of take your time over it. And in Nepal, we take our time. But sometimes when we have to do this expensive project, it's really nice to have this competition. So the rooms are very simple. It's, it's just really got a, a nice bed, but nothing much. And the view from your window, that's, that's what's spectacular. And I feel that our architecture uh, really needs to be simple and it really needs to kind of uh, not compete with the environment that exists outside. And a sense of spirituality, I feel, just comes when you look at the mountains. It's a, it's a humbling experience where you, you, you kind of understand a language which is very different in, in you know, the urban densities that we exist. Uh, this is a project, uh, the Rock Slices, at the U.S. Embassy. In Nepal, the U.S. Embassy built a very, it built a new embassy, a very large one, and it seems that they have a standard design of, uh, you know, small, medium, big, depending on the country, and they just plonk the design, get uh, workers from Turkey, material from all over the world, and have heavy security and build it. So after this was built, the uh, the U.S. ambassador was not uh, happy with the landscaping, and uh, had floated a competition that for a small memorial on you know, May 1st, they have a memorial service. So they wanted to do a, 
memorial inside the embassy and they invited uh, architects from Nepal to kind of uh, compete in ideas. So I had done this, just one drawing of uh, uh, this one page. Uh, below it shows my uh, kind of documentation to a marble quarry. It's called the Godavari marble uh, of how big boulders are kind of taken out from the mountain and they're kind of sliced up and then sold as Godavari marbles. So that uh, inventory of photographs I had in my, uh, in my computer and uh, I thought that as a memorial, I think it would be nice to have a landscaping element in the garden uh, where as you come in you see a rock but when you go around it you just see slices and that was my metaphor to the memorial that you know it's strong but it's not there, there are gaps in between. And I wrote a little poetry about uh, remembrance, recollection, respect and you know some of the thoughts I had. And uh, this design was selected and uh, so we built it. So it's beside the flag and I think it, uh, it is a kind of echo when, uh, when people leave from the embassy in the evening, it reminds uh, everyone that you know, we're about the mountains, we're about the landscape, we're, we're, we're about uh, you know, materials that exist in, in, in our place. So I look at architecture very differently after really uh, doing projects and involving myself with the community up in the mountains. This is a project I'm currently working in the Annapurna area and uh, this is a place called Manan. So the story of this is that it's a beautiful site and in uh, the 1970s when our late King Mahindra came here on a helicopter and saw a beautiful site, you know, this is the view, it's a photograph, it's not a painting. So when he saw this and when he saw the people who were very backward, he kind of felt that he should do something for them. But it is interesting to see how intentions sometimes, good intentions can sometimes go wrong because uh, he told them that I will give you uh, passports, I will give you privileges duty free so that you can travel around, you don't need to only stay in this place. So over time what happened was there was a lot of migration. People from this beautiful place went to Hong Kong, went all to Malaysia, Thailand, all over the world and started trading with the local Marwadi community. And they started kind of doing commerce in Kathmandu. And uh, you know, you have a supermarket. So since the Manangi uh, uh, sections were duty free, they used to wear four jackets and come from Hong Kong. <laughs> yeah. So over time, uh, these places that uh, I'm working on were all, it's all abandoned. You have these rich uh, Manangis who migrated to Hong Kong and uh, but now, you know, they've forgotten about this place. But then I feel that with time, no matter how rich you are, you kind of search for your roots. And uh, one Manangi from Hong Kong uh, landed up in my office and uh, he, he kind of said that he wanted to do something back in the, the place where he was born. So I went with him to this place and uh, we looked at the site and we looked at the open space and we had two choices to build. Whether to build on a new green grass, a more stable area, or whether to take one of these old houses. And I suggested that, uh, you know, if you could take these old houses, it would be a real challenge and it would not be easy, but it would be better than doing an easy uh, work in, you know, a new terrain. So after a little bit of, you know, making a model and convincing him, you know, the way architects have uh, their uh, ability to impress the clients and kind of push them towards a good solution. So I managed to uh, kind of show him the uh, beauty of this place. So this place is very, very special. It, it leads to uh, the, uh, the lake, the Tiri Chotal, which is the highest lake in, in Nepal. And there is also the Thorangla Pass that crosses over to the Mustang area. And I feel that this valley is very fertile and it's just like Kathmandu Valley in 1950. But if you don't have a vision for this, if you allow densities and traffic and you know, I think these days with, uh, with the, the kind of construction uh, devices that you have, you can just change a place. You can change Tibet into New York. So we can, we, we're losing these places very fast. And I think when we talk about communal spaces, when you talk about interactive 
connectivity to your cultural heritage. These are very important places, very virgin places where we have to really take care, not just in Nepal, but in neighboring India, Pakistan, Bhutan, this whole belt. So, last few slides, I would like to state that uh, it is uh, the spirit of a place and we need to understand it. It's your priorities. You know, is it just uh, economics? It is, is it just about more or is it about doing quality relating to your heritage? So this is, a, this is the way that we're rebuilding at that place where it is really about stabilizing the hill and trying to integrate it with the architecture that existed. This is the buckwheat that is there. Uh, whenever I go there, I become extra healthy and come back. And I feel that, you know, all of you, if you go up to your in Pakistan, I, I, I can assure you that you'll be healthier. And one story I'd like to share, which I did uh, just earlier when I was in my office in Kathmandu, just staying there, I used to wear glasses. And slowly I started practicing yoga up in the mountains. And I'm very happy and proud to say that you know, I don't overdo my computers, I don't overdo my work, and when you have a certain balance, your balance within yourself, you kind of also learn to balance your body and your parts. So, yeah. So, these are some of uh, the challenging places. Besides the beauty, it is not all about beauty, it's about, you know, why do people come to Nepal and climb mountains? You know, you're risking your life, you're kind of stupid to kind of, you know, uh, from your safety zone to come here and climb mountains. But I can assure you that the few little climbs that you do and you have a puff in your breath, you'll be healthier. You will connect to a soul and spirit which you haven't seen. So I took this trek up to the Tilichotal and uh, it, it, it was just majestic. This is the lake. Uh, where where you can hear uh, you know the snow melting and the rivers are forming in this place that's me right below just lying down it's 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 heaven you 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 just be so aware and conscious of how what you're doing and i feel that is the necessity we require in our communities in the urban areas you know i'm not asking you all to be hermits and go up to the mountains but I'm asking you to kind of see, you know, what are you working in and working at and, you know, is it just, are you building more? I think the new norm for architects should really be to build small, build with a better density and not overdo even if you have the commerce to do it. Uh, last few slides about, uh, I feel that the city should be related to your body. And the practice of yoga has taught me that, you know, you have all these chakras in your body I feel that if you look at this city with also all these chakras, you will start getting answers that relate to, relate to a certain balance and harmony. And I feel that the health and happiness in a human body is related to cities and community. And I feel that the spirit of a place like Nepal, like up in Ladakh and the mountains here in Pakistan and Bhutan, kind of make you understand a quality which is required in this world. So these are, I'm showing off a little bit. I'm inspiring you all to kind of do yoga. Uh, these are some of my poetries. Uh, I write uh, three, four lines when I'm up in the mountain and you know, stretch your mind and your body will be flexible. Stretch your body and your mind will follow. It's this big cycle, but it's all related. And doing this asana, uh, the sirsa asana was kind of very challenging, but being upside down is challenging initially, like everything in life. But after you get it, it brings about balance, strength, and vitality within you. So this one is a little more, I think architects, uh, it's for architects and for engineers, a little poetry. Uh, as you align and tune the energy centers within your body, mind, and spirit, an architecture and engineering blueprint of your latent potential will emerge. So for me, getting into yoga was an extension of architecture. It was about knowing the nooks and corners about, uh, you know, yourself. And when you understand, you know, your hand, like, you know, your hand has got a fracture, you, re you see how important it is, you know, what you can do with it. But we take our body for granted, we take our mind for granted, we take our eyes for granted. And I think that's where, uh, if you're not aware of 
how we can sink all the energies to it, uh, what is the kind of uh, real energy you have and how special you are, I think you realize that. So the spirit of a place I keep echoing because I see that priorities are changing in this world. We're looking at China, we're looking at India, we're looking at uh, America, we're looking at Dubai, we see when I came here also I got a sense of Oman and you know the places that are emerging. I think there's a big, uh, I feel it's like a Disneyland that's happening uh, all around where we're trying to build these humongous structures that kind of take a lot of energy and uh, the bigger question of is it making us happier, is it making us healthier, I think these are critical issues that we need to understand. So uh, the sharing yet with the sense of privacy from our heritage, what we have like the courtyards, parties, dungidharas, the faith and challenges that I feel are really, uh, you know, about openness. You know, the modern architecture, we're learning to build more walls. And I think challenge, openness, and we should look at cultural entity as opportunities and inspirations. And in Nepal, in some of the festivals we have, the negative side is there's a lot of sacrifice, animal sacrifice. And I kind of advocate with some of my friends that you know, we must also have the courage in our community to remove some of the inessentials. So the inheritance from our culture plays a very important part to really establish a communal space. And the question of identity I'd like to repeat is that, uh, you know, I think you have the debates here also. We saw some of the presentations of our heritage and how we can kind of integrate it with our city and really respect it. That's our challenge. Last slide, when I was moving out of the Manang Valley, this little girl was kind of playing with this rock and looking at the open space. And in a way, it kind of, uh, kind of uh, summarized what I feel about you know, open spaces in the city or up in the mountains. How do we really, what do we give our children? Do we give them more buildings? Do we give them more confusion? Or do we integrate our space with the quality of life? And it depends on the eyes that you look with. Thank you very much.